random X naught we've plugged in with all the higher order terms thrown away um, with this rough, rough approximation, okay? So if this is zero, you subtract this, so you see negative that, you divide it by the derivative here, and then you add it to X naught, and the result will be X, okay, from this. Now let me show you what that's doing here. Okay, say the function was this red line, that's f of x, or sorry, this red curve, that's f of x, and say the random variable you plugged in was x naught, just some point there. Well, when we use the Taylor series expansion, get rid of higher order terms, force the function to be zero, and solve for x, then remember, we get this equation, and you can see what we're doing is we're taking... We plug x naught into f, so we take that dotted vertical line is the, the magnitude of that. Then we divide that by the derivative of this function at x naught, which is the slope of that line up there, which is basically the vertical line, the rise over the run, the distance there. So if you take that rise divided by the rise over the run, you just get the run, which is this distance. So this whole value right there is that distance. And then you take x naught and you subtract that distance, and now you get the new x1. So you can see, you just guessed over here, and by the first iteration, we got closer to the actual root. Okay? So if you keep doing this now, if you take that new x1 and plug that in there and find the new x2, then what you do is, again, you plug it in here, divide that by the derivative, which gets you this amount, it takes that amount minus that, and that's the new x2. You do x3, and it just keeps getting you closer and closer to this point. And if there's ever an occasion where you ever overshoot to the other side, it'll take you right back. So really, after you iterate many, many times and you just keep plugging in a value, get another value, and then re-plug it in, keep iterating, um, hopefully you can see how this is working. It's slowly finding the root and getting closer and closer and closer until finally the change in the last x with the final x is, is much smaller than, you know, some, you know, like 10 to the negative 5 or, you know, some, some tolerance level that's close to zero. Um, and, you know, if you do 10 to the negative 5, that, that means it's going to be accurate within five decimal points, okay? Okay, so that's kind of how it works. It's, it's kind of a clever thing, okay, to, to solve these. So, so let's um, show you how we would actually solve this, uh, for, you know, th that, that's kind of the derivation and how the newton raphson approach works um, using Taylor series expansion with all the higher order terms cut off um, and then iterating. Um, but let's actually show how this would work. If I actually gave you this function and I said find its roots numerically, what you would do is you'd take the derivative of that function, which is this, and make sure you brush up on how to take derivatives of functions for this course. So that's, that's the derivative, okay? And then you write down, remember this is the equation that you iterate, so you have this, you just plug that up there into here, and you plug that up there into here, and you, you get this number right here, okay? So that's what you would iterate. You just plug in, start with some guess of x n minus 1, right, where n is the, uh, the indice that, you know, um, keeps advancing, okay? Um, you, you'd start with n of 1 here, and so you, you'd plug in your first x naught, then you'd get x1, okay? Then you'd plug in x1, and then you'd get x2, then you plug in x2, and you keep doing that until, you know, x, uh, till you subtract these two values, this minus this, and it's, uh, it's, it's less than some, uh, you know, uh, some threshold, okay, of, of something very close to zero. Okay, so for this particular example, remember I showed you what the, pl the plot actually looks like this, this squiggly line, okay? And so we're going to plug in some guesses here and see what happens. So for this squiggly line, using this approach, um, remember this is one, two, three, but pretend we didn't know that, okay? Say we just plug in a guess. Say we, we, we guess 0.5, where x naught was 0.5. Okay, so we started there. Well, if we plug that in and did that iterative process with that equation from the previous page, we would start getting closer and closer and closer. And it would always, you know, if you guess here, it's always going to go to the closest root. And you can see the iteration when n is 0, it, you know, you started with 0.5. And then when it was 1, 2, 3, 4, it starts slowly getting to 1 until finally with very high... Uh, precision, very high numbers of decimals, it's essentially one. Okay, so it's pretty much converged by the time it gets to six. And it's very close to converged by the time it gets to five, right? Okay, and it's always going to do that. So, but but there's, there's multiple answers. So you, you, you plug in one guess, you'll find one answer. 
Okay? And then you've got to kind of guess around and find other answers. If you keep plugging things and you keep getting the same answer, that means you're, you, know, you might want to try a different side. Okay? In this case, they tried 1.6. So this is 1.5, so they tried 1.6. And because this root is closer than this root, it crawled to this. And you can see it goes to 2 here. Okay? So um, you might ask yourself, well, what if they had guessed 1.5, which is dead on the top of the hump there? Well, then it would break, basically, because it would try and take that value and divide it by the derivative there, which is 0, and you can't divide anything by 0. It becomes undefined. So if ever you plug in a guess that gives you undefined in newton raphs and that means you basically won the lottery. You guess the one in a, you know, infinity <laughs> uh, numbers that, that could you know, uh, crash it and divide it by a, a 0 slope. Um, the chance you're going to get so unlucky is extremely low, um, you know, but, uh, but in this case you might have because 1.5 is a nice round number, right? Um, so, so, but anyway, if, if you get an undefined thing, just guess a different guess, okay? And if you, you've programmed newton raphson into MATLAB, you might want to um, teach it that if the derivative is ever zero, just ignore it and try a different guess, okay? Okay, um, and just start randomly guessing stuff around. Um, Again, if you had guessed over here, it would have crawled to that, but because we guessed 1.6 over the hump, it went right there. And then, you know, we had to guess something over the hump down here to get to there. But in this case, I think we guessed 3.5, which is on this side, and it crawled back to there. Okay, and you can see by the time it got to, you know, 5 or 6, they basically converged to the root. Okay, so you can see how that works. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, you just MATLAB function, any function, just by using that uh, very simple iteration, and specifying some threshold of you know how close you want you know how much precision you want here by the time you stop you can you can find the roots of any function okay but for a mechanism with two equations and two unknowns you know there's two inputs to the function um, remember f of f1 of theta 3 and theta 4 and then f2 of theta 3 and theta 4 in the case of the four bar mechanism um, this gets a little more complicated. You have to use the two-dimensional Taylor series, okay? And, and what the two-dimensional Taylor series is, is it's, I mean, it's obviously very similar. Um, you can see there's one function that's approximated by that function with a guess, but there's two guesses now. There's x naught and, and, and y naught, okay? And then you have the one-dimensional term, which is the first derivative, you know, with one over one factorial, which is just one, right? And then x minus x naught raised to the one power, Okay, but then you have to do the exact same thing for y. So the derivative of that with respect to y, and then y minus y naught. And I, I'm sure you could guess what would be the next term. It would be plus 1 over 2 factorial derivative of f1, uh, double derivative of f1 with respect to x, uh, times x minus x naught raised to the second power, plus 1 over 2 factorial double, their second derivative of f1 with respect to y, uh, you know, y minus y naught raised to the second power, and it would go on and on and on forever. And you do the same thing with this one, okay? But, um, you know, you don't need to care about anything above the linear term. You can just get rid of all the higher order terms from 2 on, and uh, that, those are very rough approximations of the actual functions you want, okay? And so when you do newton raphson um, remember you want to find uh, when these functions, f1 and f2, are 0, because that's when it actually applies to the closed loop vector equation for the mechanism, and that's when you're actually solving what you want to solve. So you force these to be zero, you subtract that for this side, and you can see there's that subtracted, those two, and then you pull out x minus x naught and y minus y naught, that's delta xn, delta yn, and you're left with a matrix that uh, you see the two columns shown in red there, which is called the Jacobian matrix. You might have heard of this matrix, it's very famous. Uh, Jacobian matrix is the derivative of the first function with respect to x, derivative of the first function with respect to y, derivative of the second function with respect to x, derivative of the second function with respect to y, in a nice two by two uh, matrix. And you will find that this matrix is basically the signature of a mechanism. It'll come up all the time. Every mechanism, whether you're a slider crank, a four bar mechanism, or any kind of mechanism, you will have a set Jacobian matrix, okay? And it will show up in position analysis, velocity analysis, and acceleration analysis in future lectures. So it's kind of the thumbprint or this, you know, the signature uh, uh, matrix that defines, that tells you what kind of mechanism it is, okay? And, and we use it for position analysis in the newton raphson approach in this way, okay? 
Okay, so you can see we're kind of doing the same thing as the one-dimensional thing. We do the Taylor series, we cut off the higher terms, set the function equal to zero to find the roots, and solve for x for just a random x naught input. But in this case, we you know cut off the higher terms for the two-dimensional form, uh, force both functions to be zero, uh, solve the Jacobian matrix, you know pull it out, re reorganize the, the math land and everything, and uh, we're we're going to plug in two guesses. Okay, x and y, or x naught and y naught. Okay, but in the case of the four bar, it was theta three naught and theta four naught. Okay, so two guesses for theta three and theta four. Okay, here's the uh, flow uh, diagram for like how you would do Newton Raphson, um, but it should be you know this probably makes it look more complicated than it is. So, but let, let's go through it. You know, we've kind of, I've kind of already hinted to the procedure. Um, Okay, so first of all, you, you, like I said, you just do two guesses, x naught and y naught, which would be theta 3 and theta 4, some random guesses for those, those values of the 4 bar. Set n equal to 0 at the beginning, because then the first step is add 1 to n, and now you're, you're 1 in there. Okay, and then you solve for those two things. And let, let's actually write this up here before. Remember, from this, this last slide, this is kind of the governing equation. We solve these. Okay, and, and we're going to take the Jacobian inverse and times it by that, which notice there's a negative there. And then we're going to, you know, add this change to the other side. So simplify to this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we're going to solve for these. So we're going to solve for that. Notice there's negative there. Then we're going to find the mechanisms Jacobian. Solve for that and take the inverse of it, multiply by that. And then add it to this value, okay, which is essentially... Um, our guess, right? And we're going to plug in our guess and then we're going to get the new value. And then we take that new value and subtract it from our guess. And if it's less than, so if this delta xn and y n, both are less than some preassigned tolerance, say 10 to the negative 6, if you care about six decimals of precision, right? Um, something really small, close to zero. Um, and, and remember, make sure you take the absolute value. Um, because sometimes they're plus and negative value. So you want to take the difference but absolute value it so you're, you're, you know, you're always assessing a positive value. Um, so that's what, that's what these bars mean, the absolute value of those. Um, then uh, if it's below that, then you're done. But chances are for your first guess, it's not going to be anywhere near done. And it'll just keep repeating. It'll plug in what you calculated as the next guess and you'll keep crawling to the right answer. Okay, so remember... Well, here, let, let's set it up for this. So, so you remember, though, for mechanisms, uh, these, uh, you know, the component forms are always sinus, sines and cosines. So they're, they're very sinusoidal. And that's going to be, add some interesting um, tricks to this that I'll explain in a little bit. But for, first, let's say, you know, these were the functions for a four bar, uh, the component form, where, of course, it, it only actually describes a four bar when f1 and f2 equals zero. Um, but, okay, we made it the function, so we can do the Newton-Raphson. Uh, we made theta 3x and theta 4y. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to solve the Jacobian matrix for the four-bar equations. We're going to take the derivative of that first equation with respect to x to find this first component. And remember, all the other things, r2, theta 2, r4, um, and y, are all, and r1, they're all constant with respect to x. So um, the derivative of that... Is R3 sine xn1. Uh, the derivative of f1 with respect to y is R4 sine yn. The derivative of the second equation with respect to x, remember the only thing that varies is the x term there, so it's that. And the derivative of, the, and by the way, you better be really good at taking derivative of cosines and sines for this course. That's what you're going to take the derivative of most of, because most mechanisms are made of components x and y, right? Okay, so then you'll take the derivative of this again with respect to that. And, and now you have the Jacobian. So you, you plug these into the Jacobian, okay? And then you would take the inverse of that Jacobian, which you guys learned how to take the inverse of a two by two matrix in the math in the first place, make, put a negative sign in front of it. Uh, you already have these functions, so plug them in for your guess and add it to your guess there. And then, uh, you know, again, you, you give it some random theta three and theta four x and y and you'll solve for a new theta 3 and theta 4 or x and y, and then you just keep iterating, go back and forth until this minus this, the absolute value of it, is less than some tolerance. Okay, so I just said the same thing 
uh, many, many times. And that's what this says. Iterate until this minus this is less than this. And they both have to be less than that or you've got to keep iterating, right? Okay, so here is, um, let's see here. Okay, so and you'd want to code that in MATLAB. And this is basically all you code. You just, for any equation, for any uh, uh, mechanism, you find its component form. Uh, instead of setting them equal to zero, you set it equal to a function of the two outputs that you want. Okay, and then you find the Jacobian, put it in here, set all this up, and then plug in your two guesses for those outputs, and just keep iterating until this is solved, and you'll, you'll see that you'll find a solution. Now, the trick is, is if you think about it, all these mechanisms, they're cosine and sine, as I said, okay? Which means if you plot them, um, you'll, you'll find uh, cosine and sine just keeps crossing the x-axis. So there's like infinite roots. And that, that can be confusing, <laughs> right? Re remember when I did the x to the third power, it just crossed the x-axis three times. There were three roots. But um, for sine and so cosine things, there's infinite roots, and that's because they're cyclic. You know, a mechanism, uh, it can just keep uh, repeating. The, you know, theta 2 eventually repeats after it gets to 2 pi, and then it just does a whole other cycle, and all the answers just keep being the same and the same and the same and the same. So what you'll find is when you put it in a guess, you might get some output um, that is some giant number, right? Um, so, so, like, for instance, um, say your answer is actually 0, but it, it gives you 4 pi. Well, that's basically the same thing, right? Because it's just 2 pi and then another 2 pi. So what you need to do is reduce it to, to that, uh, the smallest value you know, angle between 0 and 2 pi, um, right? Because, you know, if there, there's... Say, something, okay, let's talk degrees, even though you should never do degrees. Say it's 30 degrees. Well, you add 30 degrees plus 360 degrees, and that's the same position. That's the same thing, right? So if you ever got uh, 390 degrees, well, hopefully you'd be smart enough in your MATLAB code to teach it to reduce it to say that's the same as 30 degrees, okay? So, so it doesn't look like you're getting infinite solutions. You're actually getting the same solution or different manifestations of the same solution over and over and over again with higher and higher values. So, like I said, when you're solving mechanisms, plug in the two guesses, uh, let it do its thing, and then teach it for the, when it, when it you know, settles on some solution of what the correct position is for theta 3 and theta 4, whatever your outputs are, um, you know, make sure you, you uh, reduce them to the smallest value between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, but then there's another trick that, that's going to make you pull your hair out because remember, for every mechanism, remember the analytical solution. There's always two solutions for any one theta two input, right? Remember that slider crank. There was the solution like this way, and then on the other side, right? So, because of that plus and minus sign. Well, it's the same thing for a four bar. For any theta two, there's going to be two different configurations it'll solve. And so, for instance, for your project. If you want to plot theta 6 of that fancy mechanism that's supposed to just go straight as a function of theta 2, um, right, then you're going to need to solve the position of all the unknowns, especially theta 6, as a function of theta 2 for every increment. And every time you run it for a new theta 2 to solve what those are, Newton Raphson's going to give you some you know, solution. And you have to, first of all, reduce it to the smallest angles between 0 and 2 pi, so it's not super confusing, and you're, you're targeting to one or another solution, but there's, there's going to be two solutions, and you need to like teach it to sift out which one you mean, so it doesn't suddenly just warp to a different configuration. So when you're plotting your plots of, you know, theta 6 minus theta 2, it's a nice, smooth, continuous plot, and doesn't suddenly just warp to, to a different solution. Because remember, there's always two correct solutions for any mechanism. All right, so that, that's a little tricky. This is a very tricky concept for students to understand. Um, I usually lecture on it twice when I, when I get to do it live, but um, since you have the luxury of having videos, just, just go back and re-listen to the video and think about it and ponder it until you, until you understand this. But I've also told you all the tricks that people run into with mechanisms, okay? So, um, yeah, good luck writing that. I would, I would strongly encourage you to write a, a newton raphson thing and, and play with it to solve for position analysis for um, a number of example mechanisms and teach it to be smart and recognize, uh, you know, reduce things to the values between 0 and 2 pi and, and, and teach it to intelligently choose which configuration you mean uh, so that you can plot smooth things. 
Um, and, and then it should it should work very fast and be very effective and is is uh, you know very nice. Not not as fast as the closed form analytical approach, um, but uh, certainly much easier for you, so you don't have to solve these by hand. Um, and would you have to do this on an exam? Well, you'll see. Like you might have to set it up and find the Jacobian matrix, and you might have to write this equation to tell me uh, you know how you would how you would solve it. So okay. Okay, and like I said, you might have to solve the analytical equation uh, for a um, simple uh, analytical mechanism case, uh, much simpler than even the slider crank. Okay, all right, so those are the two approaches, analytical and numerical, for doing position analysis. So you guys are kind of masters of uh, position analysis here. Um, now I'm going to introduce some other concepts that are related to position analysis. And um, they're a little confusing as well here. So um, th this first one, it starts pretty easy, right? So we're going to talk about displacement now, OK? You, you might recall um, previously we talked about uh, position difference uh, vector, right, where you had two points on like the same body. There was like a P and a Q on one end of a bar, and on the other end of the bar a link, right? And you had a global coordinate system. And you took the position difference. There was no time happening. It was just in one snapshot. If I took a camera snapshot, that bar froze in time. And the, the P is there and the Q is there, just two different positions. You know, the global coordinate system, you find a vector that pointed to both. You subtracted those, took the difference of them, and it would point, it would, it would, point, it would be R, P, Q, uh, point to the difference of those two things, right? That's position difference, OK? L rewind back, and you'll see. Um, you know, earlier on in this topic, we talked about that. But um, now we're talking displacement. And displacement is different because it's, it's not two different points on a mechanism like P and Q. It's the same point, P. Let's say it's point P. And we allow time to happen now. So P actually moves. It actually winds its way along some arbitrary path. And then we, you know, we take a snapshot in this time when it's not primed reference frame. And then a snapshot at some delta T later where it is prime. So you can see prime means it's some delta t later uh, in, this, in the convention of the book. So p prime is some delta t later, and p is the initial time. Okay, And it, it traversed some path over time, and we got to this point, and the question is, what is the displacement vector? Well, it's very similar to the position difference vector, except instead of two different positions at the same time, it's the same position at a later time. So we take the vector from the origin, which is r P prime, it could also be 0, but remember the book's convention, if you come from the origin, you could just do RP prime, which is this one up there, okay, the, the, the delta T later, and then you subtract it, take the difference of its original position, RP, uh, which could also be RP0, but uh, we, we just call it RP there, and if you subtract those, now you get a delta RP, and notice that convention, it's different, remember for the position difference you took, remember that you have a, two points on the same body at the same time, RP minus RQ, and, and you just do RP minus RQ, and, and the, the convention was you said RPQ, because you end at P and you start at Q, right? Um, and that's the convention. Here you didn't say RP prime P. We just said delta RP. That's the difference of P in some delta T later. That's the convention. So that's the difference between position difference taking the derivative of two points at the same time and finding the, the difference in their position or the displacement, how one point has displaced over time with a delta RP displacement vector. Okay? And a couple interesting points about this is does the displacement vector tell you anything about the path? Is it tangent to the path, for instance? Well, very rarely. For instance, you know, say it started here and then we start the clock and delta t starts happening. I mean, you could go, you could write, you know, I hate displacement vectors in cursive and then come back and end at that point. And then you take the picture then at some delta t later and take the displacement and that vector would just be there to there. It, it would have no knowledge of the path it took. Okay, and it's definitely not tangent to most of the path, uh, most of the time, right? Um, th this vector does not point tangent to most of this, this path. I mean, it's tangent at some points, but but uh, it's generally not, and it says nothing about the path, okay? Now, there is a point where we, it does tell us something about the path, and it is tangent to the path, if the delta t is infinitesimal. So if you start at this p, and then just a, you know, a fraction, you know, one inf infinitieth of a second, 
later you take the next increment and you take the displacement now that vector will be pointing along the path and be tangent to it but at any other increment that's not infinitesimally small it will very rarely be tangent and will have no knowledge of the path okay so those are some insights you need to understand about displacement and how it is different than position difference okay now we're going to talk about the displacement difference between two points okay so say we have a vector here or say we have a a, a link here or a bar that um, one end is P and the other end is Q okay so two points and here we have a global coordinate system X and Y okay and this is this is one snapshot in time okay and remember these two points both exist in that time they're on the bar and we could find the position difference by taking this one subtracting this one and you get the position difference great but now we're gonna let it move through space through time okay through space and time so and who knows what path it takes it does whatever it does but some delta t later this same bar ends up up here higher up and angled differently and now this point is p prime because it's delta t later and this point is p or q prime because it's some delta t later okay so again we don't know the path we don't know the speed we don't know anything we just know that at time t equals zero it was here and at time t equals delta t it was there okay okay so let's let's uh, introduce what the displacement difference vector is okay and one thing we can do is say okay well, what's the displacement of point p well the displacement of point p is delta rp where we took rp prime which is a vector from there to there and subtracted took the difference from the position of rp at time t equals zero so took that vector minus that vector and we got delta rp that's the displacement of p in that time okay but now let's look at the displacement of q well this is the displacement of q it's you know uh, rq prime minus rq is delta rq okay and so that's the displacement of p and that's the displacement of q over a, ch a time delta t okay but now let's introduce so you know you know um, displacement vector I taught that but now displacement difference is you take the difference between these two and and what does that mean well okay so if you take delta RP and you subtract it from delta RQ notice what we did here if we take this and minus this you might as well line them up do this minus this points from there to there and that's the answer you say delta RPQ and look at that convention because we're subtracting deltas we keep a delta and because this is the displacement of P and Q, you'd put P and Q. The start of this, you know, it's P minus Q is PQ. Okay? Okay, so that's kind of weird, though. Like, why did we take two, the displacements of two different points and took their difference? And what's the significance of this vector, this delta RPQ, the, the displacement difference vector? Well, you will notice that, that if we took this, this guy, and who cares about its path, but if we just took it and translated it with no rotation um, up, you know, took Q and aligned it with Q prime, you would notice that that delta RPQ is actually the displacement of P caused by the rotation about Q solely. So who, who knows what happened in this path moving from there to there, but the, the difference in position between one thing in time and another thing is there's a translation and a rotation and by taking the displacement difference vector we can find the translation that occurred from the rotation solely and, and eliminate the translation okay and because we took our delta RP and subtracted it from Q we're gonna get the, the translation of P with the rotation about Q so you see if you rotate about Q this guy would move up there and that's the translation it would experience okay if we had taken delta RQ and minus delta RP then what we would get here is you could imagine delta RQ minus delta RP move delta RP over here and it would be that to that and so you could think now so it would be a vector that points from there to there essentially and you could think now we would translate up to P and it would be the rotation about P or it would be the, the displacement of Q as it rotates around P Okay, so you can see, imagine moving that up there and then rotating it down to there. Okay, and you could take any two points on that bar, and depending on the order that you subtract them, it will give you a displacement uh, difference vector 
um, that essentially just tells you the, the displacement of one of those points, you know, the first point you, you subtracted from, in this case is RP, okay, caused by the rotation